Hey everyone, welcome again to the Bat Ass Podcast, the Batman the Animated Series Show Podcast, where we talk about Batman the Animated Series. My name is Clay McCormick, and with me as always is Sean Murphy. How you doing, Sean? Good, man. Managed to salvage a little bit of Halloween under COVID. Uh, I hear uh, our guest actually has a really sweet Ghostbusters costume that he wore. I, that's that's true. We do have a guest today, and I, I can only imagine his Ghostbusters costume is sweet. Eric Peters, uh, he was a uh, Kickstarter backer for my uh, book, Bloody Hell. I would thank you very much for that. Eric, how you doing? I'm good, man. Good. Uh, thanks for having me on here. And uh, yes, my Ghostbuster costume is pretty awesome. It's actually the, uh, <laughs> the flight suit is from the real Ghostbusters. So it's the, the brown cart- with, the, with the green. Yep. Oh, the cartoon. Yes. Oh, cool. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, I... I have uh, I have a Ghostbusters costume that I it's probably geez oh my god I'm so old uh, <laughs> fifteen years old at this point and I used I, I modified it I tried to add something new to it every year and then a- after a certain point it 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 really ended up becoming sort of like what those costumes are for the actual Ghostbusters where it was just like a suit in my closet that I would put on <laughs> when I needed it yeah hmm. did but, you um, uh, put like a name tag on the closet door. No, I Just wish I had. If I, if uh, maybe if I get a, if we move into a bigger place, I'll have a, a dedicated uh, locker for my Ghostbusters gear. Nice, there you go. <clears throat> yeah, that should be number one priority for your man cave, Clay. If you ever uh, pull it off. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyway, we're gonna talk. We're coming up on the end of season three of Batman the Animated Series. We only have a few episodes left, and today we'll be talking about. Make them laugh and deep freeze. I'm actually pretty excited to talk about both of these. So we will take a quick break and then we will talk about make them laugh. All right. Make them laugh using microchips stolen from the Mad Hatter. The Joker brainwashes famous comedians into committing crazy crimes in order to ruin their reputations. As it turns out, the comedians are the judges who tossed the Joker out of Gotham comedy competition the year before. Now the clown prince of crime wants to seek his revenge and Batman and Robin must foil the Joker's plot. Before we get into the episode, Eric, what's your uh, background with Batman the Animated Series? Uh, Basically grew up with it, you know. Um, I've been watching it since it started. All the toys, everything, so... It kind of got me into like loving Batman. Yeah, uh, saw, I mean anything besides the '89 movie. Like this is what I had after that. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you were in Boston, so you were watching it on Fox 25, just like Clay and I were. Yeah, like uh, after schools. Yep. Did they have it all packaged together with the X Men for a while? I think they did. Wasn't there like a commercial like for it, and it was like showing like them in the background? Yeah, like, kind of like <laughs> jumping around the cities or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think there was. There was, a, there was a certain point where I think it was they had all of the comic book stuff bunched together. So you had like Batman, uh, X-Men, Spider-Man, and the Tick, I think, were all going at the same time. Right. Yeah. I remember the Fox uh, logo. It wasn't the one that everyone's thinking now. It was like a local Fox. And uh, you had like Wolverine walk across the bottom of the screen. The Batman would like pop his head through the O and then pop it back through. It was a very specific ad yeah, yeah, just yeah. for the New yeah. England area. I remember yeah. always getting excited when I saw that. And then when Warner Brothers started its own thing, I'm guessing they took the rights away. Yes, yes. Yeah, they definitely yeah. change it up. I do, I do remember um, those Saturdays when all of those things were running at the same time was like the best best day of the week by far. Yeah. And th- when they moved one of them away, because that was, I, as, a, as a kid, that was the thing, you know, before the internet and before being able to track this stuff, you had no idea when shows were going to be on and when they were going to be not on anymore. So there was that one Saturday where I turned on to watch all of my favorite cartoons and like one or two of them were gone now. And I was just, <laughs> I was apoplectic. No. I was like, I don't know what's happening, but it's, I feel like my best friends just graduated from high school. And I'm still a sophomore or something. Yeah. Before the internet, you had no idea to look up what the hell happened, you know? Right. Like yeah. You had to read yeah. a TV guide or your mom had to find something and tell you about it ahead of time. Or even with this show too, it's like you're watching Batman the Animated Series and then after a, a couple weeks later, the animation's just totally different. <laughs> so, yeah. God, yeah, I remember that moment thinking, "What the hell is going on? This is different." Yeah, and it was there was even like a three year gap or something between. No, it was less than that when they did the new the new season mm-hmm. uh, or mm-hmm. season four, as it's known with the DVDs. Mm. 
But yeah, I think they, like, they tried to make it look like Superman. I think they kind of yeah. like wanted to make them look like more similar, so they could do crossovers and stuff. Yeah, yeah they definitely streamlined everything. Yeah, it definitely looked like it was cheaper to animate. Uh, I like the clean look a lot. Like I'm not knocking it, but um, yeah. I'll go, I guess we'll get more into that when we get into that entire season. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yes, make them laugh. Um, I, you know, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. This might be my favorite. I'm not saying it's the best. It might be my favorite episode of the entire series. <laughs> Whoa! Really? More than I, uh, Heart of Ice? Yeah. I. I mean, Heart of No. I didn't say best. I didn't say best. I said it's. It might be my favorite. It's just. Okay. It's the the mix of comedy and seriousness is like pitch perfect. And it gives uh, the Joker some character and depth that I feel like he's been missing. It's almost like they were coming up to the end of the series and they were like, we've done a bunch of Joker episodes. We've always got this Joker. He's always the, 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 the blank slate, aloof, like chaos agent. We never really figured out how to give him like any pathos or character. And mm-hmm. they just give him just a little bit in this one. And I think it works great. And uh, it features the Condiment King, mm-hmm. which... I love the condiment King. I feel like uh, this episode must have been a, the brand manager must've had a sale going on or something <laughs> with all of the. Yeah. The, it's definitely the a dis- discount bin type of villains that we have here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just really, really enjoyed this. I felt like I was smiling the entire episode. I, I don't know how to, how else to explain it. What, uh, what did you think, Sean? Uh, yeah. I've always liked this one. The condiment King is uh, just, I don't know when he became a cult hit or he was a hit immediately. I think, um, but because this is pre-internet, none of us could talk to each other, and we knew <laughs> we didn't. We were able to uh, talk in a public area to all agree that he was a cult hit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm trying to think if he's ever. I know he's had Easter eggs in comics, but I'm wondering if he's ever had a legit story. And by legit, I mean a kind of a goofy story. But is there a, a miniseries that had him in it in any uh, expanded way? He was in um, Batgirl Year One. The, uh, the Chuck Dixon and Scott Beatty book, which okay. is really great. Yeah. Um, he, I don't know if he makes a big appearance. I, I know there's two central villains in that. One of them is Firefly. I don't remember if the other one is the Condiment King. But <laughs> do we really need deep dive into Condiment King, or would that ruin it? I honestly, I was thinking <laughs> because you know how I love the deep cut stuff. As I was watching this, I was like, I think I have a Condiment King story. In me. I would like to write the Condiment King. <laughs> Eric, Eric, how'd you feel about this one? Uh, I thought it was great. Like I, the whole time I was thinking about it, I was looking at Condiment King, and I'm like, that character is amazing. And I th- really think that in uh, in Sean's next White Knight story should be the main villain. Mm-hmm. I, I think, think so. Be, I think. Yeah. I mean, After Azrael, it's only one way to go. And that's <laughs> right. I mean, where, where else are you going to go with that, right? <laughs> Batman's ultimate villain. But just the, I love the fact um, when he holds up that that party, and everyone reacts the way they should react. Mm-hmm. it's like what what are you doing mm-hmm. like why don't you just get the hell out of here yeah and then he's yeah. like oh yeah well here's some ketchup and, and mustard and they're like oh here's our here's our stuff <laughs> i can i can only imagine this must have been a blast to write yeah. and uh because his all of his dialogue is condiment based puns yeah. and <laughs> i bet the writers i think it's uh you know what i didn't even say who it was written by hold on it was uh right paul now. dini and uh bruce tim wrote it uh no it's uh paul dini and randy rogel oh sorry I was uh, directed by that. boyd kirkland and um i i have to imagine dini and rogel must have been just like chuckling to themselves pretty heavily as they were doing this <laughs> yeah and then when they passed it in i have to imagine everybody who read it groaned pretty, pretty seriously <laughs> <laughs> but Ro- uh, rogel worked on animaniacs and um you know, obviously, uh, Paul Dini worked on uh, Tiny Toon, so I feel like mm-hmm. the comedy duo is was there with these two writers. Yeah, I think so too. Did you guys see Animaniacs is coming back? Hulu yeah. is doing a yeah, new series of that. Animaniacs. Yeah, yeah. My, si- my sister, I did a, a mural of it for my sister's wall of Animaniacs. Back oh no, okay. oh nice. Like I, I painted all three characters on there, and I'm sure it's painted over somewhere. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I um. This, uh, I actually, as I was watching this, I, I, I was wondering if this was an influence on White Knight as well, just see, seeing as it's a, <laughs> a Joker uses the Mad Hatter technology to influence a bunch of, pe- of villains. Yeah, he's done that multiple times, and even in the comics. Like, every, everyone's always stealing Mad Hatter devices, because they're way too cool for him to use. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, there's probably and the, the other thing too is uh this was uh I didn't know at the time when I saw this, I didn't know what uh killing joke was. I sure. didn't know what Joker's real history was. So when they said that he was a failed comedian, I just kind of assumed that that was canon. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, I think the killing joke is the first time that that puts that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, actually, what I, what I like about this episode is that the Joker, it's not like this isn't let's go and tell the Joker's history. This is just a little snippet of what happened the previous year in the Joker's life yeah. that he he wanted to enter this joke contest, but he got booted off the stage. So now he wants to kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and he wants the trophy, right? Like that's generally yeah. what he's going after. I that's, love how petty it is. Yeah, that's the thing that I love is that he he the element of character that they that they give to the Joker that I love in this episode is that you know he's he's going after this trophy but at the end batman or robin pantses him in front of everybody and he gets all upset <laughs> and so the thing with him is he wants to be um he wants to get all the laughs but yeah. he does not want to be laughed at right which i think is is a fantastic character beat to have to add to him yeah um so between these three villains you have uh, uh condiment king the pack rat and the oh geez what the hell is the last one it's um, like the mighty mom man. i think it was mighty, mighty, mom. mighty mom yeah do you guys have a favorite i mean we just <laughs> wax poetic about condiment king for five minutes so i guess that's the answer but uh eric, eric i'll let you go first <laughs> yeah i mean pretty much it was the condiment king but um the pack rat was pretty hilarious too because he robs a jewelry store but just robs like the boxes <laughs> yes and he like yeah. steals the phone that alfred called batman on he uh a lot more violent than Condiment King. He's oh, yeah. just got a gun that yeah, he just starts shooting that, yeah. people with. <laughs> yeah. Even uh the uh the last one, the uh, what the hell is her name? I'm sorry, I keep I forgot it again. Mighty Mom. Mighty, Mighty Mom. Mom. She's just got a broom. Yep. Um and Condiment King has guns that shoot mustard and ketchup. Pack Rat showed up with a an automatic pistol. Yeah, it would have been better though. Like, fire. And I guess it probably too much to think of for an animated show but if he's pack rat you would think he would create his own gun out of like junk right oh that's good yeah yeah i could see that working really well uh, um so at the this is this is towards the end of the series as i was saying uh do you guys feel like this is a end of series kind of episode where they're just kind of throwing stuff at the wall because i it feels that way on the surface but i do think it it is really well structured and well put together yeah well i agree that they thought this is let's have a let's have fun we have three episodes mm. left let's sort of check the boxes of stuff that we never got to do i don't think they knew if they were going to get renewed for a, a new season um like eric said i'm sure they were on to superman after this and that's when they decided to go back and maybe do a fourth season of batman i'm not really sure on that timeline though mm -hmm. eric what do you what do you think what do you what do you thought um at first yeah i thought it was like okay it's kind of like a filler episode right you have these weird characters but then you find out the whole point was like joker and i was thinking like why would he like wear a costume why would he like not show who he is but it's like mm -hmm. this whole time you see him He's always the guy who's like scaring people, killing people, whatever. But he actually wanted to let people know, like, hey, I'm a comedian too. And he couldn't right, get up on stage right. as Joker and tell jokes because everyone would just be afraid of him. <laughs> so at the time he actually tries to, he dresses up in costume and he just forgets to register, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he gets kicked off stage. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting because he's got I think you're exactly right. And that, that's kind of what I love is that they and they don't dive into the, I think you could expand this story and probably if this was a comic, I think you could get a couple issues out of this, if only mm. to kind of get into some of the Joker's motivation. Yeah. Um, but I don't even know if you need to, cause I think it reads so well. Cause yeah, he's, he wants to be, he wants to win this joke contest, but he wants to do it not as the Joker because the Joker carries a certain weight and connotations to it. But at the same time, he also doesn't want to enter it legally. Right. He wants to like <laughs> throw his weight around as the Joker would, but as uh Shecky Catskills comic or whatever the hell his name is. <laughs> and so he gets pissed off when things don't go his way. And it's just a really uh, deceptively complex character moment for the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> the uh the other thing i really like about this one and i i feel like the last few 
episodes have been more Robin heavy. And I love Robin in this episode because Robin just is not taking any of this seriously whatsoever. <laughs> Whereas Batman, Batman's playing it pretty straight for the most part. Like he's like, this is not a laughing matter. This is people are going to die, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Robin is just chuckling through the entire episode. And I love yeah. it. I love the beginning when Batman's like, listen, you're obviously new at this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was uh, it was funny with Pack Rat where um, he's coming at them with the uh, the golf club and Robin just kind of bows to Batman like you got yes. this and then Batman just crosses his arms and plays around with them hmm. he's like showboating and then the guy yeah. almost dies because right yeah <laughs> that's he hits both the electrical of- box and I'm like oh Batman just killed a guy and that's crazy. yeah both both of the interactions with these two villains end with Condiment King falling off a roof right and landing on a car and then Pack Rat gets himself electrocuted by swinging a golf club into a circuit box <laughs> all because Batman showboating yeah so you know maybe Batman should take things a little bit more seriously <laughs> so was Pack Rat uh, that comedian was that based off of um uh, what's his name really old timey comedian uh. Not Buddy Hackett. Jerry Lewis. It was a Jerry, Jerry Lewis. Lewis. Yeah, yeah so I, I, it's kind of supposed to be Jerry Lewis, but Roseanne is definitely uh, yeah mom. But then the first like um, Condiment King, I couldn't really tell you who he was supposed to be based off of. Yeah, I was trying to figure because once they got to the, to the third one, I was like, okay, yeah, that's definitely supposed to be Roseanne. So I was trying to backtrack and see if I could figure it out. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I I couldn't I couldn't come up with anybody specifically. The character caricature was not uh, specific enough. Yeah, um, I was doing some research into it, mm-hmm. and it said that all three characters have to do with like certain old time like comedians. And he, Buddy Sandler, was kind of like Buddy Hackett. Oh, okay, okay, sure. And then the um, Lisa Lorraine was like Lisa Lampanelli, but then it also said oh, there was like a Roseanne okay. Barr thing. With oh, it. so yeah. Well, you should you should run the podcast. You did more <laughs> research than I did. It's all the, the, the DC over. fandom app, man. You just gotta. They have everything. <laughs> it's crazy. What what is it? Uh, Whoa, DC, slow DC, down. <laughs> DC fandom. The DC like an fandom app. app. You just type, you just type in the name of the the episode and it has everything on there. Wow. Well, I guess <clears throat> I guess I'll be using that next season. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> like we've gone three. Yeah, we've gone three seasons without knowing that that existed. Um, yeah. Something similar pops up when I Google it. Uh, I don't. It's not the actual app though. Just the DC fan wiki, whatever page. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, that's it. Yep. That's it. Okay, so it's just the app of that. Yeah, I um I pride myself on my very limited research. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I get you know just like when I was in school, I do enough to get to get an A on the paper, and then anything exactly. more than that, it's yep. like you know, yeah. what what's the point? It's funny when we started out because if you listen to the first season, we're saying stuff that we know. Is not true now. Like we're like, why would they order fifty six episodes all at once? Mm-hmm. And the truth is, well, you don't have them. You don't just immediately animate everything at the same time, idiots. It, obviously, you do chunks at a time, which is exactly what they did. And uh, I don't know how. I, I think just through doing this, we've learned more about how animation works, or at least how it used to work in the nineties. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, um, we, we we have learned a lot more about syndicated animation. That's definitely for sure. <laughs> Yeah, you guys are gonna get your own uh, cartoon show now yeah yeah, yeah. that's Let's that's see. what this is it's this all uh research for launching uh the white knight spinoff condiment king cartoon series there that would go. be a, out of left field i thought about doing a uh, white knight um where it would be like an anthology you would have short stories in it oh sure talk about people like condiment king or whoever else i've, I've missed um but just some one anthology- shots yeah yeah or collected as a like maybe eight issue mini stories like sort of like batman uh black and white oh sure um kind of a thing and get different people to take their swing at it but i don't know if anthologies usually they don't sell so i'm not sure where that's that's a, that's a shame because they well it's a shame because you would think you get a lot of stories it would almost be like an i would think it would almost be an incentive where it's like oh okay yeah. cool i get like 20 different stories however i i have read enough comic anthologies to recognize that they are not always top to bottom high quality no uh, which might be a problem you know i think a lot of them are just ways where amateur writers and artists get to do a thing and publish chip in somehow and get to be in a book like sure. it's not necessarily an idea that unites a bunch of creators it's a bunch of creators who take the bus together so to speak <laughs> 
<laughs> um, that didn't mean to, yeah, well, I guess it's, they sounded the way it sounded. I'm not going <laughs> to <laughs> deny it. Um, but then you've got uh, anthologies where you have Batman black and white, and it's like, okay, we've got Batman. Everyone wants to do their own thing on Batman. No one ever can because there's a lot of rules. Why don't we just let people do what they want and we'll get the best artists and the best writers and get really creative with these like Elseworld style spins on it. And that works for a different reason because you're hiring people who don't need to take the bus together, but it's like a fun thing that they've agreed to do together for a good reason. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure. And yeah. There, there, I, I have, I have seen a lot of really good anthologies, especially independent anthologies. Yeah. Uh, cause that seems to be the indies seems to be where the anthologies live more than that's the, why it's like yeah, creators right. taking the bus together. But then you've got some like flight was a big anthology from years ago, which did really well. Um, I think I they did a sequel too. Who did that? Uh, Eric, do you remember who did Flight? Have you ever heard of Flight? I do not. I, uh, so, I think it was an image book. Um, and uh, it was about uh, a lot of the short stories. They had to just relate to airplanes or flying in some way. Oh, and that sure. That's basically okay. what united it. Had a really nice cover. <clears throat> was it Oni Press that did that? No, I forget. I was talking to an Oni editor about it once because I was talking about pitching an anthology. And he goes, oh, don't say the A word. We hate the A word. And I go, what? He goes, anthologies. <laughs> like, they don't sell. And I thought, well, you know, for uh, Oni, who's a very small press, which only had three employees at the time, I could see why it would be mm -hmm. a big risk. But then I thought about Batman Black and White. And I'm like, well, that's an anthology. And they're like, yeah. well, yeah, that's the exception. Things like that and Flight. So I remember Flight made some kind of impact with indie publishers back then, but I can't remember. You know what? I it could just looks look it like, uh, I, just, I, just, okay. I just looked it up. It looks like it's an Im it was an image book. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense because even like with the like Batman issue 1000 and stuff like that, like I don't get that stuff because I don't like that it's just like random short stories. Yeah. And oh, I, sure. I don't think a lot of people like that. Like I'm like, I'm more in it for the actual story itself. Yeah. And honestly, like if I'm following the story, I'm usually following the artist as well. So it's like, I want to see their artwork mostly. Yeah. And then all of a sudden yeah. you'll get like a, a one shot issue of like 90 pages and it's like small little short stories. And every once in a while, like I think the, was it the Joker one that just came out recently where they introduced punchline in that? Hmm. Oh, sure. Yes. So you'll yeah. get a character like that and it's like, here's their introduction. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting nut to kind of crack. Cause you, you think like, cause I, I guess, I don't know if, if this would technically count as an anthology, but one of my favorite comics when I was growing up was Marvel comics presents, which yeah. had two, two stories, two continuing stories in it, which I guess is technically an anthology. Uh, but, or maybe there's a, 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 is it, is it like a two hander? Like they have in TV speak for stuff like this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I always loved that book, but I guess there you're getting two stories that are continuing that you can follow month to month versus, right, yeah. you know, hmm. 15 different stories, but also you've got like tales from the crypt and stuff like that, that has three or four different stories in it or creepy or I, I wonder if it's just a, if it's a more, uh, dated format that is, uh, as as the way people collected comics changed, mm -hmm. um, maybe the the appetite for that uh, changed as well. Yeah, I would buy that. I mean, I would believe that. I would not yeah. buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll be eating these words in six months when you're in that, your <laughs> Batman White Knight anthology you're coming out with. Yeah, it's funny they because uh, heavy metal. I I used to kind of read off and on, and there was always like the A story, which was mm -hmm. where most of their budget went. Usually, that artist took the cover, um, and then you had the uh, third story in the back, which was usually pretty stout. And then you had this like really weak B story that fell right in the middle, and it was mm -hmm. no more than ten pages. It was usually black and white, uncolored, and it was someone who was really uh, getting their feet wet. And, you know, on one hand, I appreciate, you know, giving them um, a way to uh, help out new talent. You know, being published in heavy metal is pretty awesome, obviously. But I always kind of groaned when I got to that middle artist. And as far as I know, I've never seen any middle artists from uh, heavy metal really explode after that, you know. But I'm not a, the biggest fan of it, so I'm probably missing some obvious examples. Well, I was one of those middle artists. In uh, maybe I was looking at your issue. So technically, <laughs> technically, you're still right because I have not exploded since my work in heavy metal. But <laughs> no, I, you know when I um that uh, heavy metal was my first uh, published work coming out of college, and um, I was talking to uh, I forget who I was talking to about it, but they were telling me that um, 
Kevin Eastman, when he bought the the the, the label, yeah, had purchased all of these graphic novels that he that he he purchased the rights for them from like all over the world. Mm-hmm. And so basically, what he would he bought heavy metal as a as a place to publish them. Yeah. So he essentially would do like one story, like you're saying, one story that was usually split up mm-hmm. over like a couple chunks in yeah. that book, or maybe across a couple books. And yeah, and then and then uh, uh, smaller stories to to fit it in. And so that's actually when I was looking to to do something for them. I think it might have been my my sequential art teacher in college was like do a short story because that's what they need they need to fill those gaps and it, he was absolutely right I mean the, oh yeah the, I I uh, <laughs> uh, it's 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 one of the more um, I've my first art jobs really gave me a uh, misconception about how easy or how difficult it would be to get work in this field mm-hmm. because uh, my one of my first jobs right out of college was I did uh, concept work and animation work for Aerosmith <laughs> for a, uh, a yeah. tour video that they did and I got that job off a of Craigslist. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, it was, and it was, I, I, it was, I answered an ad that said um, uh, art, artists needed for local band. And I answered the ad and then the guy was like, oh, by, by the way, here's the tour, the tour logo for the thing. And he sent me this giant Aerosmith thing. And I was like, okay, this is either fake or, uh, you're just really slumming it looking for talent, I guess. (laughs) But, um, and then after that, my, my experience with heavy metal was I went to, I think New York comic-con and this was, this was like right before the the boom started in comic conventions. Yeah. So you could, a lot of these guys, these big names were there and there were no lines or anything. Cause you know, people just hadn't figured this out yet, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, Kevin Eastman was hanging out at the heavy metal booth. Nobody there. So I walked over, I talked to him, I showed him my story and he just kind of flipped through it and he goes, yeah, I'll publish this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I sent it to him and, uh, it got published in heavy metal. Nice. Yeah, man. <clears throat> yeah, good luck pulling that off again. I mean, it seems like no, no, yeah. <clears throat> it makes me want to. I, I, I'm curious, like, what the hell made the convention boom, boom? Like, what, what changed that made comic, yeah, con- conve- like nerd culture became mainstream. Everyone wanted to go. Sorry, the movies, right? Yeah, that's true. That helps. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly when it start. Well, I, if I'm base, if I, if I'm going on my own experience, my first couple conventions I went to in New York were very well attended, but they didn't have that sort of like everybody who was, everybody who was a name had a line out the door. That was not how it was mm-hmm. for a couple years, and I, it actually, the Kevin Eastman is a good barometer of when things change. So it's probably maybe like around. 2008 2009 because i went back to talk to him again and he had a huge line at the table right and you know after that i've never seen him just walking the floor at a show yeah the way there's like a that. wall of bodyguards i mean yeah conventions they have to follow a fire code and you know they can't just let anyone walk up to these quote-unquote celebrities and you know it's it needs to be managed right. yeah but i yeah, mean I, my i was just gonna say my my favorite and my v- most formative convention experience. I don't know if I've talked about this before. I probably have is the very first show I ever went to. I, my friend and I went and talked to Bill Sienkiewicz and he had nobody at his table. He didn't even have like a tag on the table. The only reason we found him is because my friend knew what he looked like. And we talked to him for like an hour and it was awesome. And we actually, uh, fun little side. So as we were talking to him, someone came over to show him work. And he was like, oh, my God, this works amazing. Why aren't you working? And then he was like, okay, you should content, talk to me later and we'll get something hooked up. That was uh, Toby Cypress. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he gave me one of his little uh, things. We were talking to him and stuff. But, uh, Eric, you're, you're an artist as well. You do, you do uh, the convention circuit. Yep. Um, how have things changed for you? looking at as, as someone who who hits the conventions quite often um, i assume my first uh, comic con actually was san diego 2011 sure okay and um what just jumping into the deep end there huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey might as well right but uh yeah i did that and um it was it was completely insane couldn't move but the one thing you were talking about kevin eastman he's one of the people that i met he had a booth there you just walk up to it and he was just mm-hmm. giving away free sketches yeah so i still have a framed leonardo sketch on my wall from kevin eastman wow and, yeah. um, and stuff That's- like that and um i remember at the same time my wife was walking ahead of me and, and someone bumped into me and i got really pissed off i'm like damn this sucks everyone just bumping in her and she looks at me she goes 
dude, you just walked into Triple H. I'm like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? As as someone who has also walked into Triple H, um, <laughs> I can tell you, you know when you walk into Triple H. Guys, <laughs> like a brick wall. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah, the, like I've been going to New York Comic Con 2011 up until this year, obviously. Mm-hmm. And 2011 was like so much easier to move around. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it just every single year it gets busier and busier and crazier. It's harder yeah. to get into. I'm at the point where it's like I usually go every year to meet up with some friends. I only see once a year. And I'm like, I'm not even going to get tickets. I'm just going to go meet up yeah. with friends and, and hang out. Yeah. So yeah, it's just gotten crazy. And, and the comic books are always in the back, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the, the, dirty, the dirty secret. Right. Like, these big conventions make all this money and they have to like go, all right, where do we put the fucking comic books that aren't going to make right. us any money? Yep. Let's get more celebrities out front. It's like there'll be a the, comic uh, book booth and then Lou Ferrigno. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, I bumped uh, into the Lou Ferrigno. Last... That's my Triple H story. I actually saw. Oh, there you go. Nice. Right now at a bar. He was not happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, yeah. The last New York Comic Con I did, I was walking around. Uh, I well, when I say did, I meant went to because that's like my white whale. I have never managed to get a table at New York Comic Con, uh, no matter how hard I try. Yep. And um, I was walking around. Table. What's that? Just go sneak in on Sean's table. Oh, I've done that a plenty of times. <laughs> Yeah, him and Corinne steal my water. My uh... that, no, 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 no. I've never done that. I my, will hang out for a little bit. But uh... I, I... Just, change the, just change the banner in the back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you, you're 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 not there very much anymore. So I could just I could just sit there and pretend I'm you for like six hours, and no one would know the difference. That's true. Yeah, you look like I could me. charge really. Really cheap for Sean sketches, but really expensive for Clay sketches. Clay, you look like a young Bob Seger. I don't think anyone would mistake you for me. <laughs> I actually, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2013 or 14, I actually bumped into you, Sean, at a bar. Oh. Comic-Con. It was you and Greg Capullo and Scott Snyder and a cool. couple other okay. people. So I was on my best behavior then, because I always get along with those guys. I actually, yeah, you, well, you were kind of like in the back by yourself, and okay. I, was, I, was, I was talking to them. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Was I nice to you? <laughs> Did we well, I, actually, I, I didn't even, I, I technically didn't even meet you that day. Like I saw you, I'm like, oh, that's Sean Murphy. He looks busy over there. Oh, like, I think you were like, you were like doing something. I don't know if you were on your phone or if you were like writing something, uh, but I met, you, I met you the next day at the convention. Actually, I told you about it. Oh, I might've had a commission I was fun. working on. Uh, at the, was, it, was it at Yotel? Oh my God. It was, I, it was, I completely forget the name. It was like a, it was an Irish bar right near Penn station. Uh, all right. Yeah. Not Yotel. It had, yeah, it had like three floors to it. And like there was like a rooftop bar and everything. Oh, maybe um, uh, fuck, what's it called? Nah, I'm gonna blank on it now. Yeah, it's a DC hangout where when DC was in uh, New York, they would always go to mix somethings. Yeah, and I just started yeah. going there. And I'm like, oh shit, I think I know those guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, you must have talked. Did you talk to uh, Scott and Greg at all? Uh, I talked to them. Yeah, I actually talked to Greg for like 45 minutes about like graphic yeah. design and stuff like that. Yeah, he Damn. was cool. Yeah, he's funny because he's like he can be an intimidating guy because he's he's like a WWF wrestler in a lot of ways, just his persona. Yeah, he's a big dude. Yeah. Like a and, but he he doesn't really know have a lot of like he doesn't really schmooze it up with other artists. He's just sort of doing his own thing and he'll talk to whoever. He just likes good people. Yeah. So yeah, he's if you ever see Capullo at a bar, it's always easy to go up to him. Like, don't be afraid. Greg's a pussycat. And uh <laughs> play your cards right, maybe he'll buy you a drink. Or you can buy him a drink. There you go. Yeah, I think I was going to buy him a drink, but he was already, I think he was pretty drunk already. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, um, the biggest change that I noticed is, uh, I, the last New York Comic Con I went to, I, I, re- I was walking through Artist Alley and I, re- I looked around and I was like, oh man, because I was at the first big, uh, like the first modern New York Comic Con at the Javits Center. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I realized that Artist Alley, the room Artist Alley was in, was the entirety of the show the first year. Oh, you didn't so even know that there was a whole other show going on. No, 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 no. I mean, that was the whole show. Oh. The entire New York Comic Con fit inside the room that is now just Artist Alley. Oh, 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 I got it. Oh, okay, yeah, so yeah. like every year it got yeah. bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, so it's kind of like yes. Boston Comic Con. I was in that one small area of the Boston Convention Center. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And Boston went through different ownership too, because the new place, it's more of a media show now and they mm-hmm. kind of don't know what to do with artists. Well, they put it, was a fan expo that bought them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's funny because like the old place was kind of, it was low key, it had a low ceiling, it had a weird funk to it and uh, it wasn't always air conditioned properly. Uh, <laughs> and I remember complaining at the time, but then seeing what it turned into, I was like, I don't know, maybe I was too quick to judge. Like it was kind of nice. 
Um, I, actually, I liked it the old way. Yeah, because it, it was low key and more of a basement style convention. Mm. But I remember making a lot more money those years. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas now, it's uh, uh, they, it's like they, Lou Ferrigno wasn't there to take all their money for photographs. <laughs> uh, <right>? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think the reason shows exploded, I think it had to do with the show Big Bang Theory, too. I think that became a huge hit. And I, I know a lot of people in comics hate that show for you know different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it brought comics to a mainstream. Like A lot of people who didn't even know where to buy comics saw that show and saw them in a comic book store buying comics. And they're like, oh, that must be where you go to get comics now. And it's not a thought that easily occurs to people outside of comics. Like The three of us take it for granted. But like neighbors of ours probably have no idea where to buy right. comics anymore. They still think you get it at the newsstand where you can buy Archie, which is not true. And honestly, that drives me insane because if that's true, it drives me insane that the Big Bang Theory did more for comics business than <laughs> comics or the multi-billion dollar movies that they're making based on them. Yeah, that's like, the, you know, I, I, it's a love. There's no. Yeah. Yeah. The thing the thing that uh, we don't need to get into this whole thing, but they, like there's everyone you talk to who seems to be in the know is like, Oh, there's no correlation between movies coming out and people and spikes in comic sales. Yeah. And it's like, that's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Yeah. Like it helped. Uh, well, so just to finish my thought on big bank theory is mm-hmm. I was living in New York for a lot of those years. And then the convention center moved. And then because like news outlets started reporting on the convention. So mm. you would get like giant traffic jams and everyone, you know, avoid the Javits Center. It's going to be jammed up on the West Side, blah, blah, blah. And they, they would go in and, you know, after a few years, the reporter was wearing a costume and then he was getting more into it. And then there were women. Sure, I mean, it was sure. like it just expanded because they discovered that the, there was an appetite for this stuff. So that's why New York Comic Con blew up. And then you saw these other shows blow up. And um there were sort of two shows at this time. There were these mega shows like New York and San Diego. And then there were still hotel shows which um were cheaper and easier to do but like the mid mm-hmm. the mid-level show kind of went away either you yeah. killed or you continued to be small but the middle tier was just kind of gone for a while yeah big apple comic-con was the first one that i went to where i met bill Sinkevich. that was definitely a mid-tier show yeah and they got bought out by wizard world that's yeah turn yeah and then wizard kind of dropped the ball i don't even think they're around <laughs> doing shows anymore because they stopped the magazine and then they they were the Walmart of shows for a while, uh, and now yeah, yeah. I don't even know what they're doing. I mean, I know with yeah. COVID, we're not doing anything, but right. <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how the the comic convention landscape changes coming out of this. Actually, to yeah. see you know how many don't exist anymore, what changes, how they appro- change the approach and stuff. Yeah. Real quick before we get back to the episode, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you have another one, Eric. If you do, please let me know. But what's your um, both of you your best celebrity run-in on the floor you said triple h you said lou ferrigno sean well that wasn't my best it was one that happened <laughs> yeah most most memorable i guess uh i'll go last i forget uh mine actually was a couple years ago i uh, i met kevin conroy randomly at the site oh no kidding yeah nice it was like that's early. awesome i went early in the morning to try to get like a ticket to go meet todd mcfarlane and we were there early enough where no one was around and i'm assuming that's when the celebrities come out when no one's there yeah, yeah, I went to the sideshow booth. Um, was looking around, and they were just showing him some stuff. And I went up to him and was like, "Hey, man, how you doing? Can I take a picture?" He's like, "Yeah, sure." And the picture's terrible though, because I'm not used to getting up at like eight a.m. So I just I look like I'm half asleep and hungover. <laughs> <laughs> he just looks like Kevin Conroy. So yeah, like, I'm sure. I'm sure he was thinking, "Yeah, this guy looks like shit. I'm gonna look great. Let's take a picture." <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that was pretty awesome. That's the best part about these conventions is you you don't know who you're gonna run into. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sean, do you have one? Yeah. Uh, mine's sexually explicit. I'm going to try to tell it uh, <laughs> without naming the actress involved. Um, I, was, I think I think I know this. Yeah. Story. <laughs> so uh, there was a famous uh, mid- mid-tier actress who was extremely uh-huh. hot, uh, starred in one of uh, a sci-fi show and uh, was at a convention. And I met her and her uh, boyfriend, I assume, shook their hands. And uh, I didn't know who she was. Like, I didn't even know I had seen this show. It didn't register to me that th- I thought this girl was attractive, but I didn't think movie star, movie star, movie star. And then um, someone came over and said, oh, that's so-and-so from this sci-fi show. I was like, oh, shit. OK, well, she was nice. And I kept bumping into them throughout the show because I had access to the green room where the celebrities go. So I'd run in and get a sandwich, whatever. And um, 
she would kind of like would look at me weird. Like, I don't know if she thought she knew me from somewhere else. Like, I've never seen this girl in person before. Fast forward to the bar that night, and uh, she was just, you know, getting drunk just like the rest of us were. Um, elbow to elbow, probably 200 people in this crammed in tiny bar. And uh, mm-hmm. she's sitting in the stool right behind me. And I didn't know it at the time, but she was literally getting finger banged by her boyfriend in public. And everyone at this bar knew it except for me because I had my back to her. And uh, at the end of it, and I was pretty trashed, I bumped into her boyfriend, like literally backed into him. I'm like, I turned around like, oh man, I'm sorry. And he's like, okay, we're going to head out. I'm like, okay. And I shook his hand. And uh, my friends ran up to me after me like, wash your hand, wash your hand, wash your hand. I'm like, what? He goes, just trust me. So I'm getting the whole story as I'm in the bathroom, scrubbing my hand down. And uh, I didn't even know. I mean, it all happened so fast. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I have not that, been able to watch that show ever since because of that. I I can confirm the story as true because I was there when it happened. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was mine. Uh, uh, and now when I look at her action figures, I wonder if the, if it, I'm not going to make this joke. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay. I'll tell you um, who it is, Eric, once we stop right. recording. Oh, nice. Uh yeah, I I had uh, I had one that was also uh, not sexually explicit, thank God. Uh but out outside of the show, my friend we were in New York and my friend and I had gone to get dinner at the uh that, that diner that's right under the hotel on 34th Street like TikTok or something like that. Mhm. And we're sitting, we're sitting at our booth and then the party, it's one of those things where it's like, there's a partition and then you can see to the left of you, there's like a, another booth on the other side. Um, and we're sitting down and we're eating. And then the next party who's comes to the adjacent booth to ours sits down and it's, um, Gary Coleman and Ray Park, Mm. the, uh, Darth Maul himself. And so they're each with, you know, their wives or whatever, and then they're eating. And then at the end of the their their dinner, Peter Mayhew comes over, Chewbacca, wow. and starts, you know, talking and saying hi, hello and stuff. And so my friend and I are like staring straight ahead, trying not to like gawk and just catching quick glimpses of, uh, of yeah. Chewbacca and Ray Park talking to Gary Coleman. So that was one of those weird, surreal comic book moments, I think. Who is Gary Coleman again? Um, the little, little African-American guy okay. from, yeah, that's who I thought what's yeah. happening. I can't remember exactly what show it was, yeah. but, but, uh, back to know. the episode. Yeah. Uh, well, we were Eric... a number on every other topic except for Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I about Batman. That's right. Eric, as you probably know, we do a, uh, uh, what would you draw section? And since you are also an artist, if you'd like to join us, you, you're more than welcome. Do you have anything from this episode you would be, you would like to draw? I'm literally drawing the condiment king right now. Nice. So, <laughs> All right. Like we're talking. So yeah, I kind of just want to draw him. Yeah. I I character. I'm in the same uh I'm in the same boat. I just really I don't know why that guy stood out. Maybe cuz he's such a a weird meta throwback or something. He's just yeah. such such a fun character. Mm-hmm. I would take the condiment king on this show over a lot of the one-off characters that they've villains they've thrown yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. I want to know um, where, where did he get that much ketchup and mustard? Hey man, the brand manager. You go to him; he can he'll, he'll he'll suit you up with whatever you need for a price. What about you, Sean? Um, I would do. I like the Condiment King. I wasn't gonna pick that one because I figured you guys would. So I want to do the <laughs> fight scene on the hot air balloon. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I just love uh, when fight scenes involve great heights and there's like falling and jumping and swinging down and I don't know what it is. Like it's always a fun. Uh, way to use comic book panels because you can get those really thin tall panels and do things that you normally can't do with most storytelling mm-hmm. but if they're falling from a plane or something like that you can always manage to uh play with the format a bit so uh, yeah i think i actually was thinking about that as well and i was watching i was watching that fight going would this be really easy to draw or really hard to draw <laughs> because if they're on if they're on a hot air balloon anytime you kind of push in for like a medium close-up you can kind of you don't really have to worry about perspective because they're mm-hmm. not on like a level surface so you can just kind of make a bunch of like wavy lines to be like oh this is the part of the balloon that's popping up when they're standing on it so i don't know it might be kind of (laughs) fun i always just think if you think it's going to be easy it's not yeah pretty much that's a good good art rule and the other thing with that that's another thing that reminded me of the 89 movie just that balloon yes the balloon very much yes yes um but yeah i think that's gonna oh uh what what would you guys rate this one yeah eric um, I'll give this one a four. Yeah, yeah, I'm down with a four. 
Yeah. I, I, though I think this might be my favorite episode, I don't know if I would rate it a five. I think it's, I think it's a very, very solid, respectable four. Yeah. It gets credit. It gets a lot of points because it's making fun of itself and it's taking chances in ways that most episodes don't. It's a very brave episode. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's written very well. Like there's no fat on this as far as I could tell. Yeah. And the seriousness, the the way that they write Batman to kind of like counterpoint the humor and stuff mm-hmm. is really they make him serious without making him like a caricature of himself. Yeah. Like he's taking stuff seriously, but he's not like grim, dark Batman. Who's like, none of this is a joke. You have to make sure, you know, like he's, he's taking it seriously as though, like he's aware of, of, of the actual stakes that are going on, but he's not, he's not being a dick about it. Right. (laughs) There was uh, there was one more thing I forgot. I was mm. listening to your last podcast when you guys did the Bane and the baby doll one. Sure. Mm. And you mentioned how Robin's always fighting the girl mm-hmm. yeah. and he fight, he fights mighty mop in this one. Oh, oh that's yeah. right. Yeah. What yeah. is it with Robin fighting ladies all the and time? And at the, at the end he, he takes off the little chip on her neck and she slaps him in the face. She goes, I'm back to normal. <laughs> he's like, he's like, Who could tell? <laughs> yeah. That's this right, is yeah, a nice right. critique on Roseanne and how obnoxious some people <laughs> find Roseanne. <laughs> That's interesting. I, you know, I, I'm going to have to keep keep my eyes open for that moving forward to see how often Robin ends up fighting the girl. Why is he such a lady hater? <laughs> I don't know. Seated issues. Out of yeah, all the Robins, I mean, who is most likely to fight a woman? Oh, Jason Todd, 100. <laughs> percent <laughs> Wow. Not, not even a question. <laughs> um. So yeah, that's going to do it for uh, uh, make him laugh. We'll take a quick break and then we'll be back with deep freeze. All right, Deep Freeze, story by Paul Dini and Bruce W. Tim, teleplay by Paul Dini, directed by Kevin Altieri. And in this one, Mr. Freeze is sprung from Arkham by aging billionaire Grant Walker, who is looking to freeze the world and recreate it according to his own design. Batman and Robin infiltrate the billionaire's underwater city and combat both high-tech robots and Mr. Freeze himself, who has decided to do Walker's bidding and cover the earth in a new ice age. So we have the only other appearance after heart of ice of Mr. Freeze heart of ice being, um, kind of, a uh, a, a ratings breaker for this show to some extent, yeah. because we've held it up as the, the pinnacle. And because that has been the definition of a five for us, there have been very few other fives, I think. Yeah. Would uh would you say that this episode is worthy of the return of Mr. Freeze? Uh, Eric? Um I mean I don't I don't know. It's it's weird because it's 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 a good episode obviously. Like mm. it's one of the ones that I remember from when I was a kid. Like the second I saw that giant robot I'm like, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. But I yeah, I, I yeah. think it it I think it is because it's one of those situations where it's you kind of feel bad for Mr. Freeze again. Yeah. You know, it's like he sees his wife, he finds her, and, and all he wants, he does everything he does basically just to save her life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's, I don't, he's kind I don't of a good guy. Like he, he's helping Batman and Robin. He even has the wherewithal to inform the citizens that they need to leave if they value their yeah, lives. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And I don't know if this is a spoiler for anyone, but I think I remember like in Batman Beyond. Yeah. Like he, she, he ends up saving her life, but he can't be with her because he's just a head. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Like she finally comes back to life and he can't do anything about it. Yeah. It's a good episode. What do you think, Sean? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think this is, can this can't be as good as Heart of Ice because mm-hmm. it's an origin story. Heart of Ice, I mean, origin stories is kind of a, wild, a free a free pass in a lot of ways to just have a knockout, um, you know, plot unfold. If you're going to bring him back, I think this is a great way to do it. You upgrade him back to his old suit very quickly by casting, you know, Walt Disney as the villain. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the robot stuff. I also like how we got Carl Rossum back, uh, or also known <laughs> as Carl or awesome Carl to all of his awesome robot Carl, friends. Yeah. <laughs> He's in four episodes. I didn't know the guy made that many appearances. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I thought the tone was correct. I thought the romance was there. I like the ending where he and his and Nora are in that, uh, iceberg floating away. Basically. I think it did all the stuff that, uh, Mr. Freeze episodes require. Yeah, I like this episode. Um, 
this for me kind of feels like a when a movie you have like a um blockbuster movie that becomes like a zeitgeisty kind of cultural touchstone and then they're like okay well obviously we need to do another one let's do a sequel and then they do a sequel and it feels like they're doing it just because they want to you know bring the characters back or something yeah it's just it doesn't i don't think it's bad but yeah it doesn't feel to me like uh the um what's what's the word i'm looking for the uh uh air to heart of ice you know what i mean it's I feel like my biggest problem with this episode is I think they there's too much happening outside of the screen, like off screen. Mm-hmm. It feels like there should be more episode here because you've got this whole thing with this Walt Disney character <laughs> who they just drop on you very late in the episode that he's got this society of people that he's been building. Yeah. <laughs> like a whole a ra- yeah, a, there's like a racist society of mostly white people who yeah. want to murder everyone else outside their bubble. Um, mm-hmm. like, like at the end when Batman's driving the boat away and saving their lives, those people all better be headed to prison because they're complicit yeah. in what would have been worldwide murder. <laughs> yeah yeah they they that's a lot to drop in like the last half of your episode yeah. and the carl were awesome the awesome carl stuff i i i liked but i he kind of feels like he's there just as because there's a robot in the episode like i don't really think he adds anything to the story there's um, uh, random characters in that i don't know if you guys noticed that like his robot characters oh yeah bat might yeah that might shows up yeah um, who I think again, I didn't do any research, but isn't Bat Batmite? I think in the comics is like a, 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 a from a different dimension or something. Thanks. Yeah, is it more like that? That um, what's it called? The Flintstones character. Oh yeah, so, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. The, the the Martian or alien, whatever it is. Yeah, um, <laughs> similar to that guy. Yeah, he's uh, he's. Uh, yeah, he has he has magical powers, so he's he's similar to uh, Mister Mixelplick, the Superman character. Yeah, he I was thought he was a Mixel. I thought he was a Mixelplick uh, connection for some reason. Yeah, it's uh, he either is directly or they're they're very similar. Okay. Um, oh, hey, cool. The uh, I just looked up the Wikipedia page. The <laughs> Im- the image that they use for Batmite on the Wikipedia page is uh, drawn by Corinne. Oh, cool. That's fun. Um. Yeah, it, so it's it's like a it's a lot of stuff going on that it seems kind of like smushed together. Yeah, and though I do think the story works, I do think that the Mister Freeze angle with his wife works really well. Mm-hmm. It just feels like it it could be more or it could be tighter. I think. So, yeah, you're right. The logic is a little strained when it gets to this big idea. Like if he had a small island with just his team on it, and he wanted to live forever because he didn't want to die, and he had a doing pulling off his plan involved murdering people i don't know i'm also not totally sure why part of his plan involves destroying gotham with an ice cannon for five years yeah that's that's another thing he just kind of drops is like no well you know well he's just five years it'll be it's we just need to ice gotham for five years and it's we need to thin out the herd it's pretty gross out there didn't batman and robin steal that idea the movie yeah and so Uh, and then me yeah (laughs) (laughs) hey you know the ice cannon thing has been used many times oh yeah no definitely (laughs) yes but yeah people thought that uh white knight like oh i like how sean even nodded to uh the schumacher batman that we none of us like and i thought no i did not knowingly do that i totally forgot that he used an ice cannon but i was thinking (laughs) of the ice cannon here for sure yeah 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 it's um it's just it's I don't know. It's not quite as focused for me as I think it could have been. Yeah. Um, I do love the uh, the Walt Disney character. The bad guy is voiced by Dan O'Herlihy, from, who uh, is Robocop. the uh, from Robocop. Yeah. Yes, yeah. the leader of OCP from Ro- Robocop, <laughs> which is he's he's a great character actor. He, every time he shows up, it's it's always good. He's got a great voice too. Yeah, fantastic voice. Yeah, um, that's the thing with these old '90s shows, like even like X Men and stuff, all the voices are like pretty incredible where like you couldn't really like duplicate it now mm-hmm. I feel yeah. like right yeah i i think i i think i've talked about this i don't if if not on here definitely on our star trek podcast but we were we were doing an episode of uh deep space nine and i it's it's uh dax has to help out these three klingon guys that that her you know previous life she's indebted to them for whatever reason and um 
as as this is going, these Klingons are talking, and I'm like, there's something really familiar about these voices, and I can't quite place what it is. One of them was Mr. Freeze, mm-hmm. and one of the other ones was Apocalypse from the mm-hmm. X-Men cartoon, and I don't know who the third one was, wow. but I mean, between those two, having those two voices at the same time yeah. was, was pretty, pretty was, cool. Um, I was gonna- the Mr. Go Freeze guy, he was the, the Star Trek, was he a Klingon named Kang? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I was looking it up too because I know that he had some, uh, that actor did some Star Trek stuff, even did some TOS yeah. stuff, I think. Yes, I believe if I remember correctly, and I apologize to the Star Trek fans who are going to be <laughs> raking me over the coals if I get this wrong, but <laughs> I believe the three characters, Klingon characters who they played on Deep Space Nine were originally characters they played on TOS. Okay. So it was the same three actors. And so it was like, it was bringing these guys back to have like a send off kind of thing. Oh, nice. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I do like this one a lot. I think Mr. Freeze is, they understand him really, really well. And uh, I think the, they, they do a great job of not letting him fall into just another villain. Cause as we've talked about, Sean, that's the problem when you set up a story as good as Heart of Ice mm-hmm. is that it's re- it feels really weird if you just bring Mr. Freeze back as just another villain who's just doing villainy stuff, you know? Yeah, and it's going to feel more like that in season four because f- that's what Freeze does. He has three Eskimo chicks with him and he's just Rob Robin <laughs> oh, Banks really? and yeah, it's shenanigans. Um, and you're going to really <laughs> wish that you're going to think back to this episode and be like, man, why couldn't they just hand it like that over and over and over again? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. I know that um, when I was reading about it, the, the the writers didn't want to do another Freeze one because mm-hmm. they thought Heart of Ice was like, kind of like the perfect like one it's shot a good for argument. him. Yeah. And yeah. they just brought him in because he was so popular, so they had to come up. That's why it took so long to co- bring him back. Oh, yeah. They were trying to come that's, up with a story for it. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It feels like a, like a, a contractually obligated sequel. Yeah, <laughs> and then it says that it, this leads up to the the movie that they did. Yeah, with just him, right? When right. he has a polar bear, totally. Yeah, they pick up right where uh, they left off as far as him um, in an iceberg with Nora. Like I think in the opening scene of Sub Zero, a submarine collides. No, no, no. He's in the Arctic, living with an Eskimo, Eskimo child, and his wife. But his wife is still in caps, encased in um, that uh, iceberg. Somehow it breaks, but the iceberg is definitely in the movie. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things about IMDb trivia is when um, it's clear that there's someone writing a piece of trivia that is just wants to, it's just a lot darker and more buzzkilly than a lot of the other ones where it's like, oh, this person also appeared in these episodes and these episodes. And then you get a piece of trivia like this. Because of the implication that Nora Freeze was cut off cryogenic freezing before the events of Heart of Ice, and due to the tragic nature of each shot featuring both Freeze in this episode, Nora is more than likely dead, meaning Victor agreed to Walker's plan, if only to spend time with the corpse of his <laughs> wife, knowing he never had any hope of waking her up. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty dark. You know, it also, that highlights the fact that I wish we had more of... N- Victor being shocked that she's actually alive. Like sure. if he thought she was dead, I feel like he would have been different for the last few years. Um, yeah. Yeah. Even suicidal perhaps, you know, and they could have really played up in a few different ways rather than him just get freaked out when a robot breaks him out of jail. And then he's like, Oh, she's alive. All right. Back to work. You know? Well, you know, it's one of those things where what I'm saying, I, I kind of wish it was a little bit longer. I, when it started the way they, introduce him in his cell they have that shot where as the robots breaking into the cell uh it knocks over the the snow globe Mm -hmm. and it shatters and i thought that was supposed to mean like oh okay well you know they were kind of vague on what her status was after the first one but okay i guess she's dead now and so knowing they've set it up like that you have in your back pocket this like late second act reveal yeah that nora actually is still alive or it does still exist. Yeah. And I feel like if they had had a little bit more space to tell this story, you could use that against freeze a little bit later in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, cause it's uh, the, the idea that this guy's trying to get Mr. Freeze to work for him and freeze doesn't know that his wife is alive or whatever. And then they drop it on him later. And then, so now he's, 
extra committed to doing this villainy, I think is a little bit more interesting, mm-hmm. but maybe, I don't know. I guess you, your mileage will vary with that stuff. Yeah. He swayed pretty easily. It's like, Hey, do this. Yeah. This. Okay. Cool. And Batman's like, don't and, do it because of this. And he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and the guy's like, help me help turn me into a Mr. Freeze and I'll cure your wife. He turns him into a Mr. Freeze. And then the guy just leaves and they like, yeah. they don't even, they don't even bring it up. He's like, like oh, if <laughs> for, for me, I feel like it, if, if you if you set that if you have them set that up and then everything is coming crashing around or uh, as c- crashing down or whatever I feel like instead of just having him be like a like a moping around and and sitting by his wife's bedside forever him staying behind should be so he could try and use the machinery to save her or something you mm-hmm. know what I mean because he doesn't even attempt that no Ooh. he doesn't freeze doesn't Mr freeze yeah like he's got so the the, the Walt Disney guy yeah. says, oh, we have the technology to save her. Right. And then everything comes crashing down. And it's like, I feel like oh, you could give yeah. Freeze that late, uh, late story thing where he's like, no, I'm staying. I need to use this machinery. He said that I, they could save her. So I have to do whatever I can to do it. Right. But yeah. And in that iceberg scene, you'd have a lot more uh, computers and stuff with him as they float away. Right. Like he's got his yeah. little mini lab that he can now go and fix her. Yeah, those, those computers that yeah. <laughs> still work, even though encased well, in case computers game. really <laughs> like it when it's cold out, though, Clay. You know, yeah, yeah, they probably work great. Way yeah. more yeah, efficient. The iceberg, the iceberg thing, she's dead now, right? Because she's not attached to anything. She's just, yeah, I guess. She's in yeah. A tube. Like, yeah. I don't know. Do you, what do you guys think of Mr. Freeze being a necrophiliac? <laughs> <laughs> I I like to not think about that at all. I mean, I, I mean, feel like, like that's where the story's headed. <laughs> he likes the cold, so. Yeah. <laughs> Blech. Blech. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I want to draw. No. That was nothing, though, about the, the beginning of this you were talking about, like with Mr. Freeze in the cell. It's just mm-hmm. so weird to see him, like, so scared. Yeah. yeah. You would think he'd be like, okay, why is this stupid robot in my cell now? Like, yeah. Not they like, only- oh, my God, help me. And they only did that so Batman would know that Freeze was taken against his will. But I right. don't. I don't think right, you needed right. all that. Like it was a fun scene with the robot climbing the wall with its like flappy arms. But uh, yeah. I don't, you when, when Arnold got broken out, he had some cool ice puns. So hey. that's right. <laughs> they yeah. should have done that. Yeah, he, uh, <laughs> he freezes the water pipes and breaks the wall down. Right. Yeah, he does. <laughs> after after fucking Poison Ivy goes to the costume room to get a suit. <laughs> and that was the oh. Riddler and Two Faces costumes were in there. I remember when I saw that in the theater and I saw those two costumes in there, I lost my fucking mind. <laughs> I think we all did, yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, it meant nothing. And it was <laughs> in a, not a great movie, but. I've only seen it once. I don't recall any of these scenes. Really? Yeah. I'm happy to say I've yeah. only seen it once in the theater. <laughs> I mean, it clearly made a huge impression on you, though, if it made its way into your book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Only the most swipeable moments of it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I you know I I think when they get into the core of the story involving Freeze and his wife, I do think they kind of bring him back to form. Mm-hmm. Like once they put him back in the suit, I think uh, it's it, it's almost like he's when he's in his cell, he gets he gets scared and stuff because he's more like a normal human again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then once they lock him back into the suit, he's back into Mr. Yeah. Freeze mode where he's like, I can't even touch anything, you asshole. Right. <laughs> yeah. I thought the, the two things that stand out visually for me, like uh, the title card on this episode was really great. It's just Mr. Mm-hmm. Freeze staring at you with his glowing red eyes, but I just found it it's so so effective. If I could own one title card from the series, I think that would be the one. And um, yeah, that'd be good this one. episode is also famous for the shot of uh, Victor shooting the gun right at the camera and it swirls towards the viewer type of thing. That, like that, that is something thing, yeah. that is something that I very clearly, clearly remember from the commercials for the show when I was a kid. Yeah. I think Fox used that shot very specifically in their in their Batman commercials. Was that in the new opening credits for Batman and Robin? I don't know. Is that what I'm thinking of? Is it in the opening credits? Uh, I don't know. I yeah, I, don't, I wasn't paying close attention to it. Maybe it is. Maybe I thought Batman and Robin was all like the new animation for their credits. Uh, or are you talking about like the newer one for this season? Yeah, yeah, the late, the late, late third season credit change. Yeah, which I hated. I don't know why they would change it. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I we've we've kind of debated that, and I can't I can't remember if I looked it up and it's if it gave a reason for it, but uh, it is it is an odd change. I think I think it's it might have just been to kind of spruce things up a little bit or something. Or it was a directive from the studio because they wanted more Robin focus, but they didn't really put Robin in as many episodes as they could have. Right, um, there's some right. episodes which would have, I think been have been better with Robin. And, yeah, uh, we, there were definitely a few that we've talked about that were would have been much much improved that way. Yeah, yeah. It's weird as a kid. I remember always wanting Robin to be in more episodes. So I, I, yeah, I, I mean, it kind of it kind of proves the concept of Robin, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Where it's like they create this character cl- uh, solely as an avatar for kids reading the comics or watching the show or whatever, mm. and then everybody goes, "Ah, Robin's stupid." But then all these kids are like, "You know, I actually really like Robin. I'd like him to be in more yeah. episodes." I had a big Robin phase when uh, Eclipso was happening in the 90s. Sure. Um, that weird black diamond that would change, ha- it would put people on testosterone, or I can't remember what the hell it was. Uh, was it Eclipso? Whatever. And Robin had a spinoff series, and he had a uh, staff, and I was big into uh, oh, staffs sure, sure. and weapons. Yeah. I was a big Donatello fan, and for some reason, the ghost <laughs> staffs spoke to me for a while in my life. <laughs> and uh yeah i just thought it was a really well-drawn comic just called robin i think you know i i just recently went back and read a lot of those the art in that book still holds up pretty good yeah is it mike mainly yeah i who did it i think i think that sounds sounds right yeah and uh chuck dixon wrote the the line share yeah right mainly and yeah those, those hold up pretty well he's still working uh when i did my uh homage to him through the asbat uh splash he uh said something on Twitter, like, oh, great job, thanks, whatever. This is before I, I left Twitter. Um, yeah, and I remember looking at his new stuff, like, man, this guy's, he was cranking on all cylinders back then, and he's still really good. Like, I don't know why more people don't talk about his stuff. I mean, Yeah, I haven't seen haven't seen his work in a long time. Yeah, I, I think he's still working. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys remember, I don't know if you guys read the Marvel vs. DC thing back in the 90s when Robin, oh, hell yeah. when she hooked, Robin hooked up with Jubilee? What? I don't remember that. <laughs> Yeah, you know how they all got teleported to like different places. Yeah, Robin got teleported to Jubilee's bedroom, and he didn't. <laughs> wait, wait, Robin was near a girl, and he didn't try to fight her. <laughs> no, they had to fight. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> they literally pointed. They they made them fight each other. Like the they were transported to different places. Like Superman had to fight the Hulk. Yeah, I know. Now that you say that, I do vaguely remember this. Yes, but Robin and Jubilee were dating, and it's like, sorry about this, and they start fighting, and then Jubilee beats him. Oh, okay. So he did fight her. Uh, he did fight her, yeah. Yeah, true to form. The uh, looks like the looks like the artist on that was Tom Grummet, actually. Mm. The early the early Robin uh, issues. Um, you know, I I do think in this you can tell that they pulled out some of the big guns animation wise. Yeah, because um, the fight where Batman's fighting the helicopter drone robot thing is very uh, actively animated. Like, there's a lot of extra movements that you don't see generally. And it's just a. It's clear they were were leaning into it um, a little bit more than they do some of the other episodes. Yeah. Well, the big return to Mister Freeze. You're you're not going to skimp on right. Uh, right. Yeah. There was another actually thing that um, the Schumacher movie took, where Mister Freeze was telling Batman he's going to stay, and Batman's like, "You're crazy," and he freezes Robin. Right. Like, doesn't he do that in the movie too to 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 escape? Yes, he does. Yeah, at mm-hmm. the uh, um at the beginning when they first encounter him, he freezes Robin. Yeah, I feel, doesn't that happen in Heart of Ice too? Robin just keeps getting blasted <laughs> with the freeze gun. You know, when Batman puts his cape to warm Robin, who's encased in ice, is that cape really doing a lot, whole lot? Let's think of that. It makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, unless Batman just doesn't want to get his hands cold, right? I, maybe you know, I just got for my birthday. <laughs> I got a pair of uh, uh, battery-powered heated gloves for the winter, which I'm dying to use because nice. uh, my my hands just get awful during the winter. Yeah. Um. So maybe he's got like you know monofilaments going through there that he can heat up. I don't know who's. <laughs> well, when, when they're on the boat, like driving away, Robin's sitting there in the ice with nothing on him. So Batman took his cape back. <laughs> no, I think I'm pretty sure he does. He is still wrapped in the ice because I was actually looking for that. <laughs> I like how He's the, dripping. the Batman f- f- uh, driving the boat away for some reason to me is hilarious because I don't know, like he, he's got all these this funding and all these uh, all the money going into the city. They didn't have the money to f- hire a boat captain to pilot it right. out. It's just Batman are- alone in a room with Robin shivering in the corner. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how most of their nights go. So. <laughs> 
quote with no. Sorry, that got real dark. Was he? Yeah. He wasn't being finger blasted like that girl from Comic Con, was he? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not. Kid show, kid show. Yeah, I just know um, now when conventions start up, I'm going to get some people coming up to me. Be like, I heard that episode. Who was it? <laughs> <laughs> you got you got to send them on like a scavenger hunt where you're yeah. like, well, I can't. I can answer three yes or no <laughs> questions to send you in the right direction. Yeah, it was blankety blank. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I heard that story about her. I can't imagine that's the first time that's happened. Anyway, <laughs> it's yeah. Um, What would you what would you guys want to draw in this episode? Sean, you want to go first this time? Um, I oh, it's not a very original answer, but I, I think I would do um, Freeze and Nora, but with uh, the iceberg around them floating away type of thing. Sure. I've drawn yeah. them. I've drawn him kneeling next to that uh, casement. I've drawn him like touching the glass, looking at the glass, you know, <laughs> whole, hugging the glass. There's only so many ways. And it, it's funny. <laughs> the trick to drawing that scene is always how do you handle Nora's dress? Because drawing yeah. a woman in a dress without gravity, like a flowing dress, is one of the hardest things for me to draw. Mm. Like anytime a woman is in a dress and in free fall, like I don't know what to do with Like I know what to do with a cape, but a dress is like, has pillars in it and stitching and it hits the knee or it doesn't. I, I don't know. And uh, drawing Mr. Freeze and Nora, it's always a question of like, all right, what am I going to do with her dress? Because I know what he looks like. I know how to tilt his head. I know where to put his hand. But yeah. Sorry. That was yeah, me. it's kind of, um, you kind of have to make a decision about how little gravity you want. Because I think you can, with something like that, when it's someone in a tank like that, you can kind of go, well, maybe we don't have her hair going all over the place. Maybe it is just kind of hanging straight down. You know, like you could yeah. kind of fudge it either way yeah. where you could go way over the top and it's just like yeah. her hair and her dress is going all over the place yeah. or you could keep it more simple. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's a dealer's choice. Really. Drawing really complicated hair on women. Um, it's, that's like another hour added to your day. Yeah. If you want to go straight bang straight down easy, no problem. But the way that like Terry Dotson and Adam Hughes draws hair, like that's their favorite thing to do. Obviously, like they love that stuff, <clears throat> so yeah. they're all over it. But for me, I'm always like, I've, I was just gonna say, I have never been good at that stuff at at drawing women's hairstyles specifically. Yeah. I it's something I need to practice more because every time I do it, it just looks terrible. <laughs> How about you, Eric? What would you draw? Uh, I was honestly last night thinking the same thing you just said, but uh, I'll change mine up and be like, I just kind of want to draw Robin in ice drape <laughs> Batman's cape. <laughs> it's dripping but every now and then the drips are yellow <laughs> yeah. guess, like he I just see that le- a cover you know Which he is, just like, he just left him on the bench yeah. and just turned the heat up or something <laughs> it'd be it's funny like, if, right. as he was turning the boat robin was sliding across the floor in the back <laughs> <background. laughs> well i mean compare it compare it to the the first mr freeze episode where he gets encased in ice and it's like a life or death situation and he's got to spend all that time in the tank and stuff which they do talk about at the end of this yeah. but but it's like in this one it's batman just driving home like this fucking kid he gets caught in ice again yeah. I, this is the last uh, time robin, robin. i'm not doing one of two things the three things studying for class getting shot with ice or fighting a woman somewhere yeah i could see i could see where all of that nightwing anger came from once he split <laughs> off that's why he got the mullet that's, yes that's oh man um I, you know, I was trying to, th- I was having a hard time thinking about what I would want to draw on this because I, I was like, well, what are the options? It's like Mr. Freeze doing his thing. So yeah, yeah, that's always fun. The, there's the city of Oceana, which yeah. I don't want to draw. Um, and I think what I would like to do is I would like to draw the Walt Disney guy's, um, Mr. Freeze suit because as it stands in this, it's kind of like just a, a lamer version of, mr freeze's suit but it doesn't have purple gloves which i like yeah it's just like design wise it feels like it's kind of like uh patched together it's not really inventive and usually when they do this kind of thing in a story it's like his suit is exponentially better than the original you know so it would be kind of cool to to beef up that that uh uh, walt disney suit a little bit Mm -hmm. um ratings what would you guys give this one sean you want to go i'm gonna go a strong four Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd agree with everything you said, though. It never occurred to me how quick all that stuff unfolded and how massive of an idea that was and how it it kind of hand waves it a bit. And uh, the fact that all those people were fine destroying the planet, basically, um, just as they're and nice who are and those, cozy. As, as Jerry Seinfeld once said, who are these people? Yeah. 
You know, I don't know where they came from. Or do they work for him? Yeah. They talked about him being like a, a, a theme park magnate. Are these the people who work? At, is this like that would make sense? All of the workers at Disney World decided they wanted to freeze the planet. Yeah. I mean, if he has a giant cult and he's like a Charles Manson character mixed with uh, Walt Disney, mixed with that guy who uh, was recently caught for having a cult. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. That, it's a little dark for a kid's show. <laughs> All of this sounds great, and I'm I'm sure it happened off screen where we can't actually say it's part of the story. Don't, don't the robot guy, I forget his name. Doesn't he mention like visioneers, which are like the imagineers? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Is this a critique on Disney? Do you think in Pretty some much, way? Yeah. Well, yeah. It even, I mean, the the cryogenics thing is even based on, I assume, uh, that rumor that Disney had himself frozen when he died. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it has to be. Yeah. But because this is Warner Brothers and these animators probably have a love-hate relationship with disney and the idea of disney that they are mm-hmm. fighting against in a way um do you think that part of this was a plan to purposefully take jabs at disney or yeah, am, I, am but, I reading into it too much yeah i think you're, it might be i don't know if this is if yeah. they're writing this going like this is going to be the scathing takedown <laughs> of <laughs> walt disney <laughs> that no one has ever had the balls to write <laughs> Uh, that I would watch. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Eric? Uh, I'll do a I'll do a three point five because it's yeah. like what you said before was like, you know, you want Mister Freeze to come back, but then it's, it seems kind of rushed. Where they it could have been a couple episodes, maybe mm. like a two parter kind of a thing. Yeah, but then just stuff with like Mister Freeze. It's it's always pretty great, and then seeing him like his emotions and him as a as a, like a real person and not just a, a straight up villain. You know. Yeah, you know it's it's funny because if if you were if <laughs> If I was working on this show and it's like, you've got a, this is episode uh, number 84 out of 85 that they've done over these three seasons. And the, the studio says, yeah, we want another Mr. Freeze episode. Part of me would be like, oh, that's great. Let's do a two-parter. We can t- kill two episodes with one stone. This will be great. We don't have to, we have basically, it's not a week off, but it's like, it might be a little bit easier to handle this late into your production run where it's like all right we'll just do two episodes on mr freeze it'll be great um so yeah i'm kind of surprised especially when it's this big character who's who's coming back i i would have liked a little bit more time i think yeah um yeah i think i'm gonna go a, a really high three on this one it doesn't it's just not quite over the bar for me yeah makes sense makes sense but yeah i think that's gonna do it for us uh eric do you have anything you'd like to plug um no honestly not really i don't <laughs> cool <laughs> where can people find you on uh, Inst- uh social media if you don't have you can say nowhere leave me alone if you'd like but um uh instagram it's a uh, graphic night art and it's the same with twitter uh just graphic night art cool cool how is twitter for you eric sorry to uh i don't, ask I don't really i don't really use it that much i just kind of follow people yeah because i, I, don't I really on there yeah because I, I feel like twitter is fun if you if you're starting out or halfway through your career, whatever it is, but when you, when you get to be big, Twitter really starts to suck. And I, I kind of miss the days when it was easier to, to use Twitter. Yeah. I don't know if it's just COVID made us all crazy or if there's like a, a point you hit as any pro where if you get enough eyes on you, Twitter just isn't fun it's anymore. Just, it's just trolls at that point. Yeah. 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 That's why I like Instagram. Cause it's just, I post pictures and yeah, that's kind of it. There's no, nothing really happening. There's no, people can't send you links or, yeah. or kind of do too much. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's going to do it. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you very much, Eric, for for coming on, and thank you for donating to my uh, Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, man. Thanks. Uh, I'm looking forward to that too. So, uh, so hurry up. Yeah. Clay. <laughs> doing my best. Doing my best. So well, I got this. I get this podcast. I got to do. So basically, you're standing in my way here, Eric. Oh God. Um, All right, I'll go. But uh, uh, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Sean, for coming on. And uh, our next episode, we've got the final episode of of what is traditionally known as Batman, the animated series coming up with Batgirl returns. Mm. And uh, I assume we haven't really talked about this, Sean, but I figure we could do, we could talk about that episode and then maybe do like a thoughts on the series up to this point or something like that. Yep. Yeah. I have a few ideas, other stuff I want to throw in there too, to to talk about. Cool. And And then then after that, sub zero. Yeah. We'll be doing sub zero and then we'll be back with uh, season four. So thank you guys. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks guys.